Uh, yeah, so um, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, I'm Ayaka, or I guess Akashibe, since like August 2017. Um, and my uh, talk is about uh, Mininet and how I ported it to OpenBSD. So uh, Mininet is a uh, network emulation tool, and it's specifically a tool for um, emulating a software-defined networking, or software-defined networking-enabled networks. Um, I'll kind of get into what I mean by that uh, shortly. Um, but the basic idea is um, if you're working on a component that goes into an SDN stack, like say a controller or a network application, or um, like a virtual switch or a um, switch agent that's supposed to run on a SDN-capable hardware switch, um, you eventually want kind of this semi-easy way to um, do reasonable uh, integration testing against a good enough model of a network. Uh, so that good enough model of a network, Mininet is, you know, um, intended to provide. Um, so in, like, as a background, um, OpenBSD has its own um, SDN stack that's an implementation based on OpenFlow 1.3. Um, I think Rick gave a talk about it in 2016, so if anyone's curious about that, they can kind of go back and dig around for that, um, the slide for that, or the talk. Um, so when I learned about that, um, I was using Mininet at work to uh, do some you know, manual integration testing for uh, SDN applications and controllers. So I thought it might be nice to have something for um, development purposes for like switch and switch D, so for debugging, testing, just playing around even. Um, unfortunately, like many other things that come from the SDN circle, it's um, pretty much Linux-centric, so it's only been developed to pretty much work on Linux. So notably, um, it heavily relies on network namespaces to emulate uh, fake hosts on the network. Uh, so part of my talk will be about how I used R domains and uh, other components that you can find on OpenBSD's base system uh, to kind of make a version of Mininet that works um, as a port. Uh, so before I kind of go on, um, SDN is a buzzword, so I kind of want to define what I mean when I say SDN. Um, so I can say, yeah, it's anything you want as long as you can sell a product with it, but um, I just kind of <laughs> um, want to go back to like the, the classic throwback definition uh, that was given by uh, the Stanford uh, network research group that did a lot of the early uh, SDN open flow type of implementation work and research, um, which is basically uh, a logical way to um, centralize how a network's behavior is uh, configured or defined. Um, so if you kind of look at a classic network where you say you have like 20 switches, you know, connected together, and if you want to like set up a VLAN across like part of a network or, you know, multiple VLAN, like, uh, how would you do it? Like, well, you would pretty much, you know, log into each switch in some way. Um, you'll probably have multiple like vendors, like different models of switches, in which case you have like different syntaxes, different ways you will connect to it. Um, and you basically poke at each of them one at a time and at the end of the day, you kind of hope that the, um, the collective, you know, bunch of switches would eventually converge to the behavior that you want um, as a whole. So um, if that gets misconfigured, it's also pretty hard to debug because it can be anywhere in the network um, and you'll be kind of digging around each of the devices. You might be looking at the configuration files. Um, so you're basically working with this distributed system that you would like for it to um, work as basically this one logical entity that just pushes uh, traffic around. Um, so SDN is um, kind of says, okay, a switch is basically two components that are kind of tightly coupled together. So one part is the piece that is the hardware that knows how to push packets around or look at certain parts of the packets, um, like the packet header, um, like forward it around. Um, modify it if necessary. And the other part is the logic that dictates how it's done. So the protocol implementations, or like the CLI, or those kinds of things. So each and every single one of these switches would have those two that are tightly coupled together in one box. So um, we say, okay, what if we separate the packet forwarding elements, call it a data path, and the logic, and call it a controller application. So in that case, you can have the control applications running on, say, commodity servers. Um, and then you can have them communicating with the packet handling elements, the data paths, through this programmatic API that's exposed by them. 
Uh, so now you have this control channel going from this one logically centralized entity down to all of the nodes in the network. Um, and then at that point, if you have access to the, um, the controller, um, you can start querying it. Okay, what are all the switches that you see? What are all the links that you see? What is the state of the, um, this particular device? This port XYZ down or up? Um, you might be able to configure the uh, network or the switches through, through that uh, controller application. Um, so you basically kind of reduce down, instead of having 20 different terminals, you might just have one command line or GUI running on top of this uh, control application. Uh, so another kind of benefit that comes out of it is that because you're running the um, thing dictating the logic for the network in some commodity server, you can throw more compute power at it so you can do more uh, richer kind of traffic processing or traffic engineering, um, more sophisticated things with it. Um, rather than just having a switch, which doesn't really have much compute power on its own. Uh, so kind of to just make a visual of that, you have the uh, packet forwarding elements. You'll sometimes hear people referring to data planes or forwarding planes. Uh, so that would be the hardware component of the network. Uh, they would connect to um, some control or management application um, in the uh, management plane or the control plane. And they'll be through some control channel through which the uh, controllers would either query for the network state or define some network state that it wants to push down. Um, so that's kind of like the classic sort of um, model that you see if you look at like the older uh, open flow papers and whatnot. Uh, so that's kind of the way that I'm going to interpret SDN. Uh, so in terms of uh, what open flow is, um, it's basically like the classic SDN control channel protocol. Um, it uh, originated at uh, Stanford, and now it's um, being maintained as a set of standards by the Open Network Foundation. Um, it was originally defined for uh, the behavior for Ethernet switches, so it only knew how to like, inspect or mess with um, Ethernet headers. But the um, the more current versions of the protocol actually let you um, support many other things like, say, uh, VXLAN or MPLS. Um, there are some extensions in uh, OpenFlow 1.3, which is kind of like the long-term release of the protocol, uh, that would even let you uh, manipulate um, features of optical devices like rotums, um, say, you know, what kind of lambdas to use, um, those kinds of things. So there's a lot that it supports at this point. Um, but I'm going to kind of more focused on the Ethernet side of things because um, switch is basically an Ethernet switch. Um, and um, in terms of that aspect of OpenFlow, um, you have a data path. The data path would have you know, one or more uh, flow tables. Um, a flow is defined as a traffic class that's defined by a certain set of header patterns. Um, you know, all hosts in VLAN X, um, MAC address A, B, and C, you know, this uh, IP block. Um, and you would associate that with an action. So if I see this kind of traffic pattern, I would take this action. So output out of these ports, output to this group of um, endpoints or output ports, um, rewrite certain header fields, uh, drop messages. And you just build up these sets of uh, flow rules in these tables. Um, so you can imagine different switches would have, you know, different numbers of ports, different capabilities in terms of, you know, bandwidth or um, different numbers of tables even. So there's, you know, table specific, you know, add metadata, look at this, you know, look at another table um, kinds of instructions. So in order to um, kind of do different things according to the different features, um, OpenFlow also defines ways to query for information from the switch. Uh, so a lot of the basic features are found out during this open flow handshake, but um, during the run, um, while it's running, I mean, it, can, it can also uh, query for statistics and various other things, uh, in addition to programming these uh, flow rules down into the data paths. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to like just um, just ask, because I'm just kind of running through this. Um, so um, as I mentioned earlier, um, 
Since 6.1, OpenBSD has its own um, open flow implementation uh, in the form of Switch and Switch D and the control application Switch CTL. Um, so Switch is a uh, driver that provides um, data path instances. So if you say ifconfig switch zero create, you'll get this instance of a open flow capable switch with a control channel uh, as a uh, character device in dev switch zero. Um, so that will be the control channel up to a controller, in which case, um, for this case, would be SwitchD. So SwitchD itself is a fairly minimal controller. Um, it can uh, implement basic forwarding and Mac learning behavior, so kind of just like a classic bridge. Um, one of the, in the interesting things about SwitchD is that it can also act as an open flow channel relay. Um, so it also has the capability of uh, forwarding open flow messages to a remote target. So it, um, so basically switch and switch D are always intended to work as a pair, um, despite there being, say, like another external controller that ultimately defines how uh, the switch should be programmed. Um, and then you have uh, switch CTL, which is used to query the controller for, like, say, you know, which MAC addresses do you see on the switches, which switches do you know about, um, and so forth. <coughs> Um, so that kind of going back to the development side of things. Um, in case of Switch and Switch D, um, you know, a small group of people kind of worked on everything at once. Well, maybe not once, but um, <coughs> but in the case of like say, you know, if you're working for a company or something, usually you'll have different teams. Like one working on the controller itself, you know, another one working on like the switch agent, maybe specific SDN applications. Um, in which case you can kind of, you know, start off testing out the individual components, but after a while you kind of want to see how your component behaves with respect to the full SDN stack, and that kind of ends up being like a whole network. Um, so there's different approaches, you know, off at the top of your head that you can probably think of to test a network control application or a switch, which is to, you know, stick it in a real hardware test bed. You know, that's as realistic as you can get, right? Like. Um, but it turns out that means, you know, getting a lot of equipment, um, maintaining a whole other network um, for test beds, you might not even be guaranteed to have, like, realistic traffic patterns, so you might need to buy, like, expensive equipment for, like, traffic emulation. Um, so you might say, okay, let's dog food on our own network, um, in which case you can't really do anything too experimental because then you might actually break your network and Next thing you know, people can't print or something, and they'll be angry at you. Um, so in the last case, um, you might say, OK, I'm still a bit wary of trying to dog food it on my network. Um, using the test bed's kind of hard, because I want to test on many different kinds of topologies, or I have these different kinds of scenarios that I want to test quickly. Um, I couldn't get a time slot on my test bed, because test beds are usually shared. Um, in which case, you know, I also only have a laptop, so why don't I try to emulate a network? Um, as long as it's kind of, you know, it looks realistic enough to my application, I can do some initial basic sanity testing and development to make sure it's sufficiently working before I actually try to test on hardware. Um, so that's kind of where Mininet comes in. Um, I just kind of took the, the description from their... Uh, the website, so it calls itself a emulator for rapid prototyping of SDN networks. Um, I think it also kind of calls itself like an interactive development environment um, for SDNs. Um, so it kind of comes with a fixed set of like these few sets of things. Uh, one is the MN command, which kind of gives you this ability to launch um, parameterized topologies and basic sanity tests um, just from the CLI. Um, you can also look at Mininet as a set of uh, Python libraries and APIs uh, used to um, script custom topologies and um, run different kinds of uh, experiments. Um, you might also want to be able to kind of play around with the uh, topology that you've created, you know, take down links, inspect hosts, make hosts do, you know, various funny things, uh, in which case you can attach a CLI for that topology. Um, and finally, um, if someone's not too keen on um, scripting together a topology, uh, they can also drag and drop and create one. Um, and that's called mini-edit. Um, I don't really use it too much, so I actually 
haven't really tested that. Um, but yeah. Uh, so to kind of give a better idea of what this tool looks like and how it's kind of used, um, I'm just going to go through a few um, basic usage examples. So uh, by default, um, so if you install Mininet, um, you can just run MN by itself. And it kind of tries to give you same defaults that make it usable. Um, so in this case, I'm just launching one of the sanity tests. Um, there's two different kinds of tests, iperf-based and ping-based. Um, so the iperf one, you can imagine, like it's used to say, OK, how much throughput can my switch handle? Or how much throughput can my controller manage to deal with? Um, and the ping-based one is, you know, can my controller even basically handle like just a base connectivity case? Um, so here I'm running. Um, and then with the iperf test, um, it just launches its baseline uh, topology, which is one switch and two hosts and one controller. Um, so it kind of starts off um, outputting, OK, I'm adding hosts, adding switches, I'm starting a controller. Um, and then it finally runs a test. So it runs an iperf session across the two hosts, and then it just exits. Um, so I'm kind of missing one final line there saying, OK, it took this many seconds to run this uh, experiment. Um, so you can also kind of specify, OK, I want different kinds of topologies. So um, and different kinds of switches and controllers uh, if they're installed on your system. So in this case, I'm just launching a, a chain of three switches, the linear topology. Um, so it's basically three switches. Each of them has a host hanging off of it. And I'm using the system bridge because I kind of, yes? So when controller just, you know, just, uh, like a controller, would it be like an application? Uh, yes, it would just basically be, it could just be like some Python or Java thing that, so maybe yeah. So you can drop that in somewhere? Yeah. So um, yeah, I'll kind of go more into how it does things um, a bit later. But um, yeah, so in this case, um, I'm using SysBR, which is, OK, I don't want to worry about SDN for now. I just want to see something with the classic Linux bridge. So I'm not specifying a controller either, and I want to run the ping test, um, in which case it does the same outputs, does the ping test, and then just uh, tears it down right after it finishes. Um, so it's fairly, even though you're not getting any like fancy sophisticated uh, topologies, you can just specify things fairly quickly and just kind of have different scenarios. <laughs> um, so if you're just testing, and if you, or rather if you just specify a test, it's just going to run it and then tear down the topology soon after. So if I want to actually play around with the emulated network, um, I would attach a CLI to it. Um, if you don't specify a test, MN would, would just kind of give you a CLI automatically. So I'm just starting the same topology as before. Um, I'm also suppressing the output so you don't get the whole um, start up and tear down um, outputs. And here, um, I'm just kind of taking down a link between switch one and switch two. I'm running the ping test, um, bringing back the link, and then I'm testing, OK, H1 didn't have any connectivity to anyone else, so let me run a ping from that host to H2. Um, underneath, it's actually resolving the host, host names to IP addresses. So you can just specify like node names um, as Mininet gives you. So the convention is hosts start with H, switches start with S, and uh, controllers start with C. Um, so I run the ping, and then um, if I want to exit, I'll just control D or exit. Um, there's several other uh, commands that come with it, but I'm just going to kind of just give a subset of them because it'll be kind of boring and meaningless for me to just read out each of the commands or features. Um, so if you want to build more complicated topologies um, or like run specific experiments, um, as mentioned before, you can kind of use uh, Mininet as a, uh, a library for building topologies and networks. Uh, so here, I'm manually building uh, the baseline topology that the MN command would give you um, by just defining this topo object and passing it to a Mininet object that would then take care of attaching it to the CLI and then starting and tearing down the network afterwards. Um, so you know it's just a Python script, so I can just run it, and then it will just give you basically exactly the same 
COI and features that you would get from it. Um, so topology is nice, but if you want to do more kind of crazier things, um, say have hosts run in certain ways and behave in certain ways, um, you can also uh, run commands. So here, there's two different ways of running commands. So CMD is used to run a command from a node. Um, and quiet run is basically against the whole network. So basically, it's a, it's a command that's run against the host running Mininet. So here, um, I'm just kind of starting a very, very minimal you know, host connected to another host and starting a Python HTTP server in one and then curling it from the other. And just as a contrived um, example, I'm just listing all the interfaces. Um, and you can only really do that from the, uh, the Mininet host uh, or the, the host running Mininet because if you run it from a host, you only see the interfaces that are part of that host. Um, so yeah, and this is an example of using the mid-level level API, which deals with individual like hosts and links and uh, switches rather than say the topo uh, object, which is like a higher level API construct. So Mininet defines several different uh, levels of APIs. Um, and finally, um, in terms of like the different kinds of controller and switch types, um, one that kind of gets used a lot when people work with Mininet is the, the case where you have like a controller that you're, you want to run, um, but Mininet itself doesn't know about it. Um, so you'll just run a instance of this controller externally and then point a topology to it. And that's the uh, remote controller feature. Um, so it's one of the uh, preset controller types you can specify for MN or um, each um, like network component type is associated with a class. So you can also have this remote controller class um, that you can just pass to, uh, the, uh, to a script. And it's actually not a real application, but rather just a representation of where the controller is. Um, so yeah, like um, going back to how people usually tend to do uh, development involving Mininet. Um, if you have like a controller application, you'll use either like the remote controller, or if you get kind of get tired of manually launching your controller, um, you can even use the APIs and extend them so that um, and then or the uh, scripts will um, understand how the how the controller should be started. Um, for the switch side, um, it gets a little bit more complicated uh, because um, and it was more intended as a um, way for testing network applications um, rather than uh, control uh, rather than switches. Um, if you have a V switch that can run on your host, um, you can just do a similar thing as with the controller, extend Mininet to um, so that it understands how to handle it. Um, but if you have, say, like a optical switch or like a Rotom sitting next to you, um, there's another thing that um, some people might do, which is, okay, they might have this topology running on a host uh, sitting next to this hardware switch and have the host, ex host interfaces connected to like the ports of that switch. And they'll just include the host ports into a topology so that it looks like the switch is connected to, a, to another larger network. And kind of as an aside, like, um, so Minet itself isn't implementing all these different kinds of software switches or controllers. Um, it's kind of relying on what's available to it on the OS it's running on. Um, so it's also kind of an interesting way to sort of just figure out how an SDN stack, like a certain combination of switches and controllers, uh, might behave. So you can just kind of run it like as a standalone fake network that you can kind of experiment with. And um, because you can kind of just easily spin up you know, topologies that you can kind of play around with, um, there are actually some universities that use it in their networking courses as like a teaching tool. Um, so I kind of thought that was like an interesting side usage. Um, in terms of how it's implemented, um, as I've mentioned before, it's basically a series of Python classes um, that have been taught how to uh, manipulate specific aspects of a network. Uh, so Mininet is, Mininet the class is basically a coordinator that knows how to um, build up a topology, run experiments, and then tear it down. 
Uh, topo is basically just a convenience class defining a topology um, because you can just build it up manually using like the mid-level APIs as opposed to using topo, but it's kind of convenient if you have like say a class network or a bunch of class networks that, that are part of like a data center or something. Um, so you'll have like a class then like um, repeat that out for how many ever that you need. Um, nodes uh, represent one switch, router, host, um, controller, some, some node in the network and understands how to uh, configure uh, that element. So a host would just be some kind of end host running an application or just a shell. Um, a switch would be a, a switch, but um, it would also know how to configure that particular virtual switch that it's interacting with. Um, and a controller, pretty much similar to a host, except it's running a controller application and knows how to configure and launch this uh, controller. Um, Intefs basically represent any kind of port that's in the network, so host ports, switch ports. Um, and of course, a pair of intefs would make a link. And finally, there's like this separate CLI that's used to attach the topology. Um, so if you look at the Linux implementation, the original one, um, that kind of turns into a node just being an interactive bash instance running in a network namespace. So network namespaces basically provide a virtual network stack that a process and its descendants can kind of run against. Um, so it just provides its own um, address space, IPv4 and IPv6, uh, routing tables, uh, firewall rules. Um, so just basically um, like network interfaces, uh, network devices. Um, so as far as that um, process is concerned, when it's running in a network namespace, it has its own network stack and it's none the wiser that there might be others with similar kinds of um, namespaces. Um, the switch, the default that MN would give you is a OpenV switch instance. Um, you can choose from several other ones, um, like say um, a user space switch because OpenV switch on Linux has a kernel module so it's, it's considered a kernel switch. Um, you also have the, uh, the Linux bridge if you need like a baseline non SDN. Uh, one. Uh, the controller, uh, the default one that you're given is the Stanford reference controller. Um, it's basically the original open flow switch. Um, it runs like some ridiculously old version like 0 0.8.9 or 1. Um, but you can also choose from more um, um, modern uh, controllers like uh, Ryu or Pox or Nox. Um, the interfaces are basically virtual Ethernet devices. Um, they're called VFs in uh, Linux. Um, and they're kind of configured with a mix of if config and IP route 2, depending on what you're doing with them. Um, so like that kind of just, that's just me kind of saying in a roundabout way that Mininet is just basically a bunch of Python that calls a lot of uh, shell commands that you can only run on Linux. Um, so this is kind of me replacing the, um, the output for MN and with the um, corresponding uh, commands that get run. So um, MN exec, I guess I forgot to mention, um, it's just a wrapper around the 7S syscall. Um, it's a system call that's used to, I think, tie a thread to a network namespace. I think it creates one if there's not one available. Um, so first what it's doing is creating these bash processes for each of the hosts and switches. Um, then it creates all the links, uh, then it configures the interfaces um, on each of the hosts. So when it's creating the links, it might move some of these um, interfaces into these namespaces so that they're assigned to hosts. Um, and then it finally uh, starts up the controller, starts up the switch, um, and then you'll finally see the CLI. Um, and this is pretty much um, a slight, like slightly simplified versions of the commands that it runs um, in the background. Um, so those, in addition to the basic use case, um, there's also like more sophisticated features that it has, like say um, if I want to use um, traffic shaped links that um, drop messages at you know certain levels or um, hosts with less CPU. Um, so you can do like more resource constrained experiments, but um, 
the ones that I kind of went over were considered like the base core features of Mininet. So that's kind of where I want to start off in terms of what I wanted working on OpenBSD. Um, once I realized that um, the current maintainer was kind of interested in having it actually ported, um, he was like, oh yeah, like you should also like try to maintain um, Linux support. Um, so you can't, I can't just like simply just rip out the, the Linux commands and put in the OpenBSD ones. Um, so I wanted it to build on either from the same source. Um, and at the point where I learned that I was going to try to import into the ports tree, I also wanted to reduce the um, number of external dependencies. So off the top of my head, um, if I have KShell, why use Bash? So in terms of what I need, um, there's like a small handful of things that I would absolutely need for it to run on like for Mininet to run on an arbitrary operating system. Um, so I would need to be able to create these fake hosts that, are, that look network reachable and behave, behave as if they are these hosts running on a network. Uh, so I need network virtualization of some sort, like something that substitutes for network namespaces. Um, I would also need different virtual uh, nodes and links uh, for building up my topologies. I would need controllers to run um, OpenFlow capable or SDN capable uh, software switches. Um, and I also need like the baseline tests that use ping and iperf. Um, so the network virtualization is where the R domains come in. Uh, so kind of like a quick recap. So um, a routing domain kind of um, works pretty similarly like in terms of what it does, like as network namespaces. So it provides like a virtual network stack. Um, you can restrict processes and its descendants to use that particular network stack instance. You can also add interfaces into them so that um, there's a way out to the outside world. Um, it will also have its own um, routing tables. It can have more than one. Um, so our tables and our domains kind of go hand in hand. Um, and then there's also the pair interface, which, as its name suggests, is a virtual Ethernet device that's intended to be used as two ends of a uh, virtual link. And what you can do with these endpoints is to move them into different R domains, and now you have um, these links connecting those two. So kind of going back to how I would implement this in OpenBSD, I would have a uh, K shell instance running in a routing domain. Um, I would use the exec command as opposed to the MN exec set an S syscall wrapper thing. Um, a switch would become a uh, node dedicated to configuring a switch instance. Uh, the classic bridge version would know how to configure bridges. And the controller would become a uh, node running switch D. Um, so for the remote controller instance, um, I would need the relay, the, the switch D relay feature. So I would also have this other instance of switch D running, but isn't necessarily represented by any node in the topology as far as Mininet is concerned. Um, and then I have the pair interfaces for the indefs and the links. So kind of using like a visual um, side by side comparison. Um, of a baseline topology created by MN. Um, it basically kind of just looks like a search and replace. I just replace namespace with R domain, K shell with bash, um, open V switch with switch. Um, there really isn't much more for me to really point out here, but it, it was a pretty good one-to-one uh, -one sort of substitution. Um, as for the commands that get run in the background, um, it turns into this set of things, so for instantiating the hosts and switches, I would run route, uh, route exec, start a casual instance, um, start up, um, instantiate pair interfaces, move them into the different R domains, um, assign IP addresses, and then finally start up the switch D instance and connect the switch to it, and then I'm back at the CLI. Um, so now that I had the OpenBSD version of all the commands and the base features that I wanted. Um, I kind of had to figure out how to still keep the old original Linux ones. So that unfortunately ended up involving quite a bit of refactoring. So that kind of made it a bit more trickier to upstream. Um, but at 
kind of looking at like where the specific commands are implemented. Uh, they were usually in the node and in test classes. So um, I just kind of defined this lowest API below the low level API that a, um, that a version of Mininet running for a certain OS just needs to implement for their node and in test classes. So say um, if you have a OpenBSD node, um, get shell would return you a K shell instance inside of a route domain versus the Linux one would get you a bash running inside of a network namespace. Um, they'll differ in terms of how you run commands. Um, so you would do route, ex uh, route exec for the um, OpenBSD one. Um, I forgot what it actually uses for the Linux one, but um, yeah, anyways. Um, and like for the interfaces, creating them would either require, you know, IP route if you were using Linux or just if config if you're using OpenBSD. Um, so yeah. Um, but luckily, um, the rest of the like anything above the mid-level API up, so like topologies, um, the CLI, um, the mininet command, like the MN command itself, they usually interact with the network in terms of the more platform agnostic kind of abstract um, actions that you can take on nodes and links. Uh, so I didn't really have to modify them. So I can take the previous, um, the test.py test uh, script and just kind of run it on my OpenBSD version of Mininet. And unless I run um, certain commands that kind of expose more of the details of the underlying implementation, you wouldn't really notice. Uh, so for example, if I like ask for the details, um, hey, I noticed that it's using IF switch instead of OpenV switch and um, switch D instead of controller and my uh, PIDs also look more randomized. Um, so the one um, bit that I did have to change in uh, MN was basically teach it to use, um, to take as a controller type or a switch type, switch D and uh, switch. So, um, when I was trying to kind of figure out how to port things over, um, Bob Lance, the current maintainer and upstream of Mininet, was like, oh, yeah, it's, you know, Python. It's highly portable because you're just calling, you know, commands and stuff, and it'll be a weekend project. <laughs> and <laughs> um, so that, yeah, that um, turned out it wasn't the case. Um, so it turned out there were some places, like, it wasn't just, only the command differences, um, but also some interesting behaviors. So um, I think the most um, entertaining one here would probably be how Mininet CLI actually waits for uh, commands to complete. So if I say h1 ping h2, um, it turns out that underneath it changes the um, shell prompt to a special sentinel character that it waits for. <laughs> so once it reads that sentinel character, it knows that the command completed, so it can give you back to Mininet CLI. So at the point where I was porting this to OpenBSD, it was 6.1 and the K-shell um, root prompt, uh, because Mininet messes with um, creating and destroying devices, asked to be run that root. Um, the prompt uh, required a um, hash, pound, octothorpe, whatever it's called, um, in the, the root prompt. So apparently that messed with the uh, sentinel finding feature of the CLI. So you know, once I ran h1 ping h2, I couldn't exit out of that. Um, so I was like, OK, I'm going to you know, just work around that in Mininet. But um, Keisho got patched around it instead, which kind of surprised me a bit. So um, afterwards, I, I, I kind of saw some people going, hey, what's up with this new behavior change? Who changed Keishell? And I'm kind of just looking around going, <laughs> You know, yeah, no, I'm not going to say anything. Um, so in terms of like the, the commands that you can run um, against the host, um, network namespaces and our domains have a bit different kind of notion of what should be visible inside of a namespace. Uh, so going back to if config, if I run h1 if config on uh, the original version of Mininet, you would see um, h1 eth0, which is the one one and only interface that will be part of that host unless you've added more uh, interfaces to that host. Um, for the OpenBSD version, um, you would see all of them because you can still see all of the, the interfaces that were instantiated. 
Um, and it also uh, relies on um, being able to change the names of interfaces and devices so that it can keep track of where it is in the topology. Um, because I can't really change the names of the interfaces on OpenBSD. Um, I kind of did two different things. One is to add like a map for keeping track of what MinNet wants to track and the actual name of the, the ports. So earlier, uh, so if you look at the links command, you'll see pair two is H1 ETH zero, pair three is H1 ETH one, and you can kind of cross compare because um, initially when I didn't have that and when I was trying to play around with it, I would end up having to have the if config output next to the topology and then that kind of ends up being a pain. Um, but so that, that command would look different on uh, Linux versus OpenBSD. Um, so another bit that caught me off guard was um, route exec. If you try to exec something inside of an R domain that doesn't exist, um, it doesn't really let you do that. Um, so I ended up having to kind of create another uh, external, inter like an extraneous interface so that an R domain can be um, guaranteed to exist before that casual instance is started. Um, so each of the OpenBSD nodes, versions of the nodes, would have an extra interface attached to it. And uh, finally, our domain IDs only go up to 255, so there's a topology size restriction um, at this point. Well, this is a pretty arbitrary limit. This is a case of nobody's ever going to need more than. Oh, OK. This would be relatively easy to extend. No, it's a five minute project for town defying. Uh, when I worked for a company that used OpenBSD firewalls, we town defined that to a larger number. Oh, okay. Um, so compile, compile, read the file, done. It's not even a free library. Be careful. It's easy. Do it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. I put that defined in there thinking that nobody's ever going to use more than that. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Wait, I wasn't supposed actually, to apologize. Actually, the limit is not 255 arguments. The limit is 255 routing tables. Right. I saw in the man page, it's both, like, in the man page says both our domains and our tables now. Our domains are a special form of routing tables. OK. Yeah. So, yeah. I'll, so yeah. you cannot have more than 255. OK, yeah. Okay. fair enough. But, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk offline. OK. But yeah, um, so I guess current status, um, the features that I described during the basic usage, I pretty much have implemented and have it ported over. Um, Mininet has many more features, um, some that I didn't go over. A lot of it kind of is like sort of these experimental features, like start multiple Mininet interface instances in different hosts and connect them together over SSH tunnels and kind of weird fancy stuff. So I don't have those as well. Um, certain kinds of special, like resource limited or throttled uh, links and hosts, um, because they use like C groups, uh, TC, IP tables, uh, stuff like that. Um, I haven't gotten around to translating them over um, yet. Um, also, um, right now, the controllers and switches that you can have are switch and switch D, and that's it. Um, that's pretty much only only the matter of porting over more types of controllers and uh, software switches. Um, an improvement over the original would be, you know, I don't want to always run as root, so being able to kind of just um, not always do that would be nice. And uh, finally, I'm still sort of working on upstreaming, unfortunately, um, because I changed a lot of the lower level aspects of it. Um, I think I just kind of made that more difficult for myself. Um, but um, if people want to experiment with it, um, Net Mininet's been uh, available in the ports tree for OpenBSD since uh, August 2017. Um, I also maintain a GitHub fork of Mininet, uh, which also supports FreeBSD and Linux. Uh, the FreeBSD ones use uh, vimage jails. Um, so I guess I can try doing a demo. So by itself, um, that's also another thing that I need to clean up. A lot of features and a um, bunch of um, parameters that don't really apply to um, the OpenBSD version at this point. But if I were to say start a um, 
tree topology with two depth and two um, display. It'll just start up a topology. Now I have something. Um, so I have you know, four hosts instantiated, um, each with one interface uh, connected to um, how many switches? Three switches. Um, stuff like that. Um, I want to display all the links. Oh. You can see that there's you know, a bunch of links. Um, if you kind of want to see what's actually behind there, you'll see that it's been kind of automatically instantiated. Um, so I'll show if I want to see which um, uh, switches that switch D is aware of, I can also kind of list them out. Um, sanity testing, I can do you know, ping across different hosts. You should also now be able to see um, all the Macs that the switches have learned. Um, yeah, I, I could also just run the commands from here as well. So if I say shell switch CTL, if I can type CTL show summary, I can just run it from here as well. Um, and I just hit uh, control D to enter, uh, exit that. Um, if I were to say have like a modified version of switch D and I, for some reason, I just don't want to run it from the, uh, from Minionet or MN, um, let's say I have something running over here. I can point Minionet to a remote controller. Um, I mean, I could have actually, I could have stuck that switch D inside of like an R domain to pretend or brought my other, okay, <laughs> fine. Um, controller remote, so I specify, you know, it's running on 6653. Um, and if I do that, you see that um, one switch has been started. Controller saw it, it did a handshake. Um, negotiated to 1.3, um, so now it knows how to um, manipulate that switch, so now I can do like, is it iperf UDP or, um, so these are the, theoretically all of the, the commands that are available from the Mininet CLI. So if I were to say, do an iperf UDP, it will just kind of start it up between H1 and H2 and come back whenever it's done. Um, so at one point when I was trying to make the iperf command work, um, I was inexplicably uh, killing X on my laptop um, when I was waiting for iperf to uh, come back. Um, it's hanging for some reason because it's a demo probably. Uh, so when I used to do that, it would kill X and I'll be like, what's going on? So it turns out I had overlooked um, as a as someone completely inexperienced with certain things, um, how the regex matching for pkill work. So <laughs> that was, yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of like, you know, like basic kind of me messing around, but. Um, so I guess there's a bunch of people that I need to thank and I'm probably also missing others too. Um, but yeah, so I, need to thank Bob Lance, who's the upstream for Mininet, for um, being enthusiastic about having it run on things other than Linux. Um, I don't think he knows like all the details that actually went into making it work on uh, OpenBSD and FreeBSD. Um, so I kind of, um, I thank him for his moral support. Um, I also need to thank Rick for introducing me to uh, Switch and SwitchD and pointing me to um, our domains. Um, and also having an interest in seeing this uh, be ported. Um, I also have to thank uh, Kazuya. Um, I cornered him last year at BSD CAN because I was a bit confused about how um, the remote, the, the open flow proxy feature for us, which D worked. Um, so I kind of hunted him down after someone was like, ask him, he would know. Um, so he kind of let me pick his brains about that. And I had to finally thank uh, Peter Hessler for um, his 
mentorship and his crash course on how to build and import ports, um, and for suggesting that I talk about this because it didn't occur to me that you know this was a topic that can be um, shared, I guess. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, thanks. Um, any questions? You wanted this for a reason, so how are you using it? Ah, so. Um, my thought is I'll eventually start, oh gosh, I'm about to make a promise, I guess. Like, <laughs> um, so I wanted to like, figure out how to work more with Switch and Switch D. And this was kind of my way of trying to figure out how it works in general. So um, first, understand how, it, how a user would interact with it through ifconfig, through Switch Cuddle, you know, stuff like that. Um, so that was like first step. Um, and now I'm just like, as I'm actually playing around with different topologies, you know, different kinds of, you know, controller parameters, I'm starting to see where the shortcomings are. Um, so it, it's kind of slowly starting to give me like a list of uh, these are the parts that are still sort of not mature in uh, in the SDN stack. So I'm just in theory just getting started. Um, um, Bob. Thank Two you. thoughts immediately come to mind. That I want to get you in a room with people to try to put some of this in. Maybe the other things. One is our, of our regression tests. We constantly have issues to be able to easily, in a regression test, test things like this where we end up, oh, I want to test four things talking together with Libre SSL. Oh, but I can't put it in the regression test. Oh, because I, end, I don't know what port I can use where the regression tests are. So this comes down to if you've got a, a framework that easily lets me drag bits into a routing domain and do it from layer two on up, it's almost like well, I could use something like this possibly in regression tests, which is, which is interesting. The second thing is I want to put you in a room and stand over and, and, let, and let you talk about how this works and stand the stick over the people who write VM CTL and VMM and wire that into, instead of KSH, so basically, VM-based hosts. So that's kind of interesting because another thing I also wanted to do was instead of using it as like an SDN network modeling thing, I want to say play around with BGP, and I want to model BGP routers. I can't really do that with our domains apparently, so yeah, I would need VMs. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Oh, absolutely. Like a regression test, it would totally be case. Like, the topology of VMs yeah. might be a bit might be a bit heavy, but at the same but time, especially when it comes to your case, so if you want to run BGP, you want the VMM, the VM in the yeah. middle somewhere, right? Yeah. BGP and a bunch of KSH hosts around them. So, yeah. But don't distract from getting it. No, no, no. I know. I'm just saying. I'm saying. Hey, this is your. your I have a crippling sense of self-worth. <laughs> <laughs> The basic sanity tests work, <laughs> um, but like another thing that I wanted to do was by playing around with Mininet, just with Switch and SwitchD, I can maybe uncover some of those shortcomings and maybe do something with that. Yes. Um, I mean, you're, you're 
Um, but uh, if there are ports of like open vSwitch or other vSwitches, it shouldn't be in theory hard to kind of reteach Minionet how to use it. Um, so it, it's just a matter of there being ports or not. Like same with the controllers as well. Sure, yeah. Um, do you want me to do that order? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, um, is there any other questions? Trolling? Um, okay, yeah, I think I'm done and almost pretty much right on time. So uh, thanks for coming to my talk.